My name is Kesia, and I'm a wellness content creator. And this is a letter to my younger self. Um, this is the self that just got out of high school. I have some breaking news for you. Shit is about to get real. And before I even get into all the curveballs that life is about to throw at you, I'm just, about, I'm just gonna tell you one thing. Everything that is coming to you is unpredictable. You are not going to be able to control it. It's going to be frustrating. It's going to be very, a very interesting experience that really throws you out there and gets you out of your comfort zone. But the one thing that will keep you going, the one thing that will make sure you make it through all the curveballs is knowing who you are. I feel like if you do not know who you are, everybody around you will tell you who to be. And if you do not have your own solid foundation, you'll find yourself bending and adjusting to what everyone tells you to be. But it will never fully fulfill you because you'll always feel like you are denying a part of yourself. The part of yourself that wants to be authentic and wants to be fully herself without having to feel like you are adjusting or fitting in a box. You are definitely not meant to fit in a box. Absolutely, 100% sure. And so with everything that's coming to you right now, just make sure you know who you are and you will be able to navigate through all of it. Hey, Seth, how are you? I'm, I'm alive. You're alive? I am alive. This, this feels so interesting because <laughs> to some extent, I feel like I'm interviewing my boss or rather as <laughs> close to my boss as I ever get in my field. <laughs> yeah, I, well, it's, it, the thing is, um, I, I don't know if I count in that space, right? Really? Wouldn't that be her? Like, she counts as a boss. <laughs> yeah, I'm kind of, we work together. Okay, yeah, we, colleague. We are, yeah, 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 there yeah. you go, collaborator. Mm -hmm. yeah, so yeah. when we were looking for guests for season four, mm -hmm. you stood out for me because of your platform, The, mm -hmm. the Growing Father. Mm -hmm. um, and the one uh, clip I saw of you that really, you know, caught my attention mm -hmm. is the one where you were talking about um, postpartum depression because mm -hmm. it's always spoken about from like the female mm -hmm. point mm -hmm. of view. Um, why The Growing Father? Why did you give it that name? So, um, good question. Uh, initially, it wasn't called Growing Father. Mm -hmm. So, in the beginning, um, it started out as daddy.co.ke. Um, and the name needed to change um, because I would go into meetings and they'd be like, daddy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> that was weird because adults calling you, you know, it's like a Zoom call because this was, you know, mostly pandemic time. Yeah. Be on Zoom calls and it's like a serious NGO and we're talking about doing a program for, you know, underprivileged, you know, youth in some specific area and they want me to talk about it and they're like, um, yeah, daddy, do you have anything to say? <laughs> like, nope. Okay. We need to change the name. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so that was the one thing. The second thing was my daughter was born. And when my daughter was born, I started really rethinking fatherhood as a whole. Mm -hmm. And two things came up to me. One is we very often reduce fatherhood to the title of dad or daddy. In this case, it was daddy because my son says daddy. Mm -hmm. And second was um, because I realized that a lot of the content that existed out there about fathers was very surface. And it didn't accommodate the one thing which I thought was, was critical, mm -hmm. which is that we are all flawed, um, we're all on a journey, and we all have a lot to learn. So if there's anything that I want to share, it's about what the growth that fatherhood has inspired. Yeah. So initially I wanted to call it Flawed Fathers, um, but that was taken and also it, was, it, it had a negative connotation. And then I thought, well, growing is positive. Mm -hmm. um, and then I just overnight changed the name to yeah, Growing Father okay. and I stuck with it. Um, yeah. Also, it had a cool logo because the GF with the negative space looked mm -hmm. nice. And I was like, I like that. So, yeah, stuck with it. So when you think back to your childhood, yeah, mm. is there anything that happened or... Just your childhood in general, is there anything that might have um, motivated the platform? Yes. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm going to try and stay positive about this. I don't want it to seem like it's a negative thing. Mm -hmm. I didn't grow up with my dad um, for the most part. I think you can count on like maybe two hands the number of weeks he was in my life. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that, that had an impact on my whole perception of 
being a parent. Both my wife and myself did not want to be parents for the longest time. Mm -hmm. So we'd been together probably like seven years by the time we had our first child. Um, now, the reason I bring all this up is that you can get inspired in two ways. Um, you can get inspired by being given um, a template that you want to fill. So, you know, the, the, the role model, mm -hmm. you know, um, this is the role that I want to model. Or you can, you can get inspired by negative space. This is the space I want to occupy. And mine was very much the second. Mm -hmm. um, the minute I knew I was going to be a dad, I immediately started thinking to myself, what does this mean? And how do I occupy as much space in this, you know, emptiness that I didn't know? Yeah. And what I realized over time is it's not just like doing, it's not a checklist of things you do. Um, it, like I said, it's a journey that you go on. So it's about kind of getting in there and really getting involved. And then the second thing was, um, I grew up with my mom. So the, the, the role model side of it is she is a staunch, um, she doesn't like this being, this being said about her, but she's very much a feminist. Mm -hmm. um, she says she's a human rights activist, and I agree, uh, or human rights advocate, and I agree, but she's, she's very much a feminist. Yeah. And one of the things that she's, she's taught us over time is that there are things that are engendered, that are gendered in, by society to, um, to kind of reduce the role to something that a woman does. So mm -hmm. like parenting, when you think parent, you don't generally, like you will say dad is a parent, mom is a parent, but the actual work behind it um, is almost entirely associated with mothers, yeah. which is, is weird because the work is gendered, but the title isn't. Um, so for me, when, when I became a dad, I also became a parent. Mm -hmm. And I think those two things are very separate because um, the dad is, is it's a default. The parent is the work you put in. Yeah. And for me, it was like, I have to be, I have to put that work in. And I learned over time, like I wasn't perfect in the beginning. My wife will attest to that. There's those times when, you know, I'd, I'd do the dad thing and just kind of not contribute and say I'm helping and I'm not helping. It's my job. I should be doing it. So yeah. slowly over time, you kind of learn more and more about what you didn't know. <clears throat> and it changes you into like a different type of person. So, yeah, um, th the childhood kind of inspired that mm -hmm. a little bit. Yeah. Right. So speaking of childhood, mm -hmm. um, you can go ahead and read us your letter before we Ooh. get into it. Said, it's August 2009, you're 23. I'm writing to you now because you've loved enough and lost enough to learn. You've lived several lifetimes, some of which you'll never talk about, some you may forget a lot of which will form your legacy. There are three little lessons that I want you to take from this letter. First one is learn to listen, second is lie less, and the third one is love more. Listen to your mentors. You've been to several dozen countries, quite a few of which you'll definitely forget. In your travels, you've gained access to some of the greatest and most visionary minds of your time. They will give you words of advice, warning, and information, and you will not process it but you will remember it after life teaches you the same lessons by force. The second applies to the people, oh sorry, the same applies to the people in your personal life. Listen to them with intention, with purpose. Be deliberate, be present. You're about to lose a lot of loved ones through circumstances and consequences. As I said, life will give you a chance to listen before teaching you by force. The hard-headed often have to feel it to believe it. Learn to listen to life. She will speak to you through powerful voices. On a similar note, stop lying, especially to yourself. You've closed off facets of your life. You've buried them in lies to protect yourself. And I'm sorry life was not kind. But at the same time, the idea of how to, to protect yourself has become a habit that can and will hurt others and yourself. You don't have to tell everybody everything, but you do need to tell some people some things. Those things need to be true. Um, you've been practicing various forms of deception, and let me tell you, young man, honestly, honesty is a skill that takes twice the effort of lying. Seek help, go to therapy, embrace your truth. It will lead you to a life of, uh, it'll lead you to a lot of life you've not been living and a lot of love you've not been feeling. On that note, love more, not in quantity, but in quality. Learn what it means to feel and give love what it means to other people. You have a finite number of heartbeats. 
so do other people. Spend each heartbeat like currency, receive each gesture of love like an investment, grow it through contribution and effort, enjoy it through experiences and indulgence. Do not be wasteful, but don't deny yourself the little life has to offer. <clears throat> Your motto is still live the life you love and love the life you live. This will change, but for now know this. You can't live without love and you can't love without being true and learning to listen to others and yourself. Be better to yourself, don't push so hard. Sleep, run, bike, hike, meditate, eat better. Over the next five years, you'll need to change your ways but not your path. Keep going, you'll be fine. Love, 37 year old said. P.S. Brace yourself for December. Uh, Just reading that, I'll remember the state of mind I was in. And uh, um, there's something actually from, from Ayan's letter to my younger self, which when I was writing this really stuck with me. Mm -hmm. And it's that thing of um, not sharing a lot of yourself because you don't want to be a burden to others. I can't mm -hmm. remember exactly how she said it. She said it a lot better. But like um, when I was writing this, I was thinking about that. Yeah. Yeah. And your letter was also very, very specific. August mm. 2009. I yes. don't think we've had anyone else in the podcast be that specific. Oh, I had a date in mind. Really? Yeah. <laughs> what, what was happening in August of 2009? Um, so the, the specific date I was thinking about was like August 10th, 2009. And um, at the time I was in Dubai. Um, I was on my way back from Kenya. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'd, I, I used to live in the States. Um, I'd come to Kenya for just visits, like a short visit um, to do some quick things. You know, Yeah, let me not say it. It'll sound like a flex, but I came to do some small things. And then um, I was on my way back to the States. And um, I, was, I was in an airport mm -hmm. in, in Dubai International, and my flight got delayed. And you know, because of the way those flights work, one gets delayed, the next gets delayed, so on and so forth. And they had to find like a series of flights that connected. So I ended up staying there for two days with nothing to do. Mm -hmm. That's why I was writing to that time because I remember spending a lot of time reflecting. Yeah. I remember coming up with a plan of what I wanted to do and where I wanted to go. And like, um, I I think I still have that um, that notepad somewhere in the house where I started writing down notes on like my master plan and calculating um, my number and all these type of things. And then, uh, yeah, then I went back to the States. Now, that specific time was between when I left a really, really, um, I guess, important job in my life. Um, and I just started a company with some friends of mine and that, that experience went terrible. Mm -hmm. um, and I was also a few months away from leaving the States forever and I didn't know it. Um, so yeah. Was it was like a turning point, but yeah. just before the turning point, mm -hmm. like the bottom of the hockey stick before things go. Yeah. Yeah. And if I can get a bit ahead of myself, go you ahead. say brace yourself for December. Yeah. What happened in December of '09? Ah, uh, okay. December of 2009 was um, was was when I left the U.S. Mm -hmm. There is a very dramatic story around this. I don't know if you want to hear it. I do. Okay. Um, so I was I was in the I was in the states on an F one visa as a student, mm -hmm. and um, I wasn't. I mean, you know, you've known me a while. I'm not the most sit in class and pay attention type of person. I am a bit of a hustler. Mm -hmm. So from the time I got to the states until that time, my goal was to make money. Um, so I didn't take my studies very seriously. I did like the bare minimum number of credits, and then spent the rest of my time hustling. Um, now, uh, in that specific uh, season, mm -hmm. I had just left something that was like, it was basically, a, it was a consultancy, but it was almost like a full-time job. Um, I'd been working in the music industry and, and like got to do a lot of really cool things, made a decent amount of money. So I decided um, in like March or May of 2009 to stop doing that. Mm -hmm and um, just focus on finishing my degree. I was very close to finishing it. I was like four credits away from finishing. Um, so I decided, let me just focus on that. And while I'm doing that, set up a business so that when I'm done, I can just shift to my business and do it all legally. <clears throat> and this is how karma will get you. Because um, when I came back, mm -hmm. um, the, the school was so used to me not attending 
that the international student advisor didn't record me coming back. So he didn't list like I was in any classes or anything like that. Um, I think it was intentional, but then I, you know, that's my own suspicions and conspiracy theories. But whatever the case was, they give you three months. If you're not doing any classes, three months, and then your visa lapses. Mm -hmm. So um, August, September, October, nothing was filed. So as of no November, I was out of status. Yeah. Uh, so one day... Uh, oh, and I was working on campus. So, like, my company was set up in an incubator that was, you know, at the university. So one day, um, I get a call uh, December 4th. I get a call from uh, campus police, and they're like, hey, um, you know, are you, are you around? Are you on campus? I'm like, no, I'm not. Um, I'm at home. In fact, I had left school like just earlier because my business partner was sick, so I was going to his house to drop off some food. So um, he's like, yeah, are you at home? I'm like, no, 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 I'm not at home. I'm leaving. I'm actually just going to take some food to a friend of mine who's sick. And they're like, okay, we'd like you to come in. There's some tuition paperwork that needs to be sorted out. I'm like, I paid my tuition in full. Like, yeah. there's, there's nothing that needs to be sorted out. And they're like, no, no, it's just some things that you need to sign and we need you to come in. Like, well, I can't, like, if you're at home, we can come to you. And I'm like, well, that seems like you're making this urgent. It's not. Yeah. I'll just see you guys tomorrow. So, like, are you going to be in the office tomorrow? Yes, I'll be in the office tomorrow. Cool. Um, are you going to be home later? I'm like, maybe. I don't know. Like, I'm going to see how he's doing. And if he's not well off, I'll stay with him. You know, can you tell us where he is? I'm like, I don't feel comfortable <laughs> telling you where someone else is. Um, so, eventually, after the back and forth, um, you know, we just ended it there. I went to this guy's place, came back to the house, and um, everything was like blinking, right? So voice notes, my emails, my Skype, everything had like blinking messages all over, and it's just different people trying to reach out to me. So I picked up my phone, which I'd left there I, back then. Actually, to this day, I think you guys know this. When you call me, I don't pick up. Yeah. Um, it's because of things like this. I tend to just leave my phone somewhere. So um, I picked up my phone and the first number that had called me, I didn't know who the number was, I called it back. And it's an international student advisor and he's like, um, said, I messed up. You need to get out of your house now. I'm like, okay, can you explain more? He's like, nope, you need to get out of your house right now. So I said, okay, and um, went, packed up everything I could that was sensitive and um, everything I needed and just kind of left. So n not a lot. Like I took like two pairs of shoes, a few black t-shirts, a few pairs of jeans and, like, and money yeah. and then left and a few other things and left. And, um, and then when I'm on the road, I call him again. I'm like, okay, can you explain what's going on? As I'm like, literally as I'm driving out of my driveway, a convoy of police cars is driving in. I was like, like okay. Movie. Yeah. So <laughs> genuinely I was like, what is going on? Um, so uh, they drive in, I'm driving out, I'm like, please explain to me why this is happening and please tell me that the car's driving into, um, I won't say the name of the place, but tell me that those aren't for me. And they're like, oh yeah, they're for you. Um, and this is why, and he explains, you know, immigration, uh, mm -hmm. for as much as people love Obama, Obama was like the worst for immigrants. Um, and uh, he was like, yeah, they were, they were coming to get you and like deport you on the spot. But if you leave by yourself, you can still apply for a new visa. Mm -hmm. So as long as you don't get caught, if you leave the country, you can apply to come back. And I'm like, that just sounds dodgy. And I'm like, what happened? Like, I know I've done everything I need to do, what happened? And they explained to me, well, you know, this bit of paperwork was supposed to be submitted by this day, you know, grace period, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So technically for the last month, you've been out of status, which means that they can forcibly remove you from the country, da, 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 da. And I'm like, okay, cool. Um, let me talk to my lawyer. Talk to my lawyer. She's like, well, yes, technically that's true. Uh, come to my house. So I go to her house, um, stayed with her for a little while, and we basically tried to find, this is the worst time to try and find tickets back to Kenya because it's December, and yeah. every single Kenyan in America is going back home or has booked or whatever. So not only are flights expensive, they're not easy to find, and everyone I'm talking to seems to think this is my fault. So nobody believes me, and I'm like, I had nothing to do with mm. it. For the first time ever, I was actually attending <laughs> class. I was actually doing everything. Nobody believed me. My uncles, my aunts, my cousins, everyone was just like, this is what you get. Yeah. This is what you get for doing what you did. 
um, including like even my, my family, my mom, my brother were both like, what did you do? What did you do? Anyway, eventually um, I met with a few people. I tried fighting it, you know, but initially it's like, talk to this person, talk to that person. Um, they all came back to the same thing, leave the country and then come back. Yeah. And um, eventually I got a ticket, uh, went to Chicago for a little while and then um, left, went to the UK, tried to apply from there. They told me that there were some charges against me and I was like, what? Cool. Left the embassy because the minute I hear that and you're in the embassy, yeah. it's like something can happen to you and I don't want this to happen while I'm in the UK. Um, and then took a flight to Kenya and I landed here on um, the 31st of December at like 11 something mm -hmm. or one, I don't know, but like beginning of 2010. Yeah. And I've not gone back. Ever since. That's, that's really like, yeah, truly brace yourself for December. Yeah, yeah it, was, it was rough. And yeah, like you, you leave so much because you never think about it, but like once you've set up a house and mm -hmm. you have stuff in it and you've been there for a while and you set up a business, you build friends, networks, etc., and then you just have to like walk away from it. Yeah. Yeah. At the time, it felt like losing everything. And honestly, over the next few months, I genuinely did lose everything. And that's why I say brace myself. The dramatic bit shook me so much that I didn't take time to experience everything else that happened. Mm -hmm. So it just rippled, you know? Um, you know, the IRS came in and took everything from the company. Um, you know, a lot of the back and forth with, with family and friends meant a lot of relationships died. Mm -hmm. um, that's what I was saying, like a lot of friendships and things will just die through circumstance or, yeah, so a lot of that happened because you're telling people, I didn't do anything, yeah. and everybody's like, you squandered a perfect opportunity. Mm -hmm. What is wrong with you? Yeah. And then you have to reconcile that and like figure all these things out. So it was very much like a burning down of everything that I'd built over the last like 10 years prior. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but um, it, it, was, it was a big inflection point. Like I had to, I had to really sit with myself and, and yeah. get some things through my head. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now your letter had three main lessons. Mm. The first one being learn to listen. Mm -hmm. And at the beginning of that point, you said that you have been to so many different countries mm. that you even forget some. Yeah. And as a travel bug, this intrigued me. Like, how is it possible to have gone to so many countries <laughs> that you that forget, you forget some? Ah. It's very possible. First of all, I spent most of my time in hotels or offices. Mm -hmm. So um, the, the, you can land somewhere and go do what you're doing and then leave without really seeing the place. Mm -hmm. um, I, there's a story I used to tell, well, which I, I'm going to tell, I guess. Um, there's a time I woke up in a hotel somewhere in Europe and um, I called the reception to ask where I was. <laughs> yeah. Where were and, you? Uh, I don't remember. I think it was either it was either Budapest or Bucharest, one of the two. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember calling and asking, and they laughed. And I was like, I'm I'm being very serious. And it's because at the time the person I was working with was doing a 17 city tour mm -hmm. in um, in Europe. So we had to go before the artist comes. You go and do the tour. Um, you know, set up all the radio interviews, check all the venues, make sure everything is ready, all the things that are going to be needed for the shows are there before yeah. the person comes through. And then when they come, you go through with them again. So technically, that's like 34 flights in a month. Yeah. By flight number 11... You, you, if you told me to list the 17 cities, I couldn't tell you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So right now you're even like a check-in master. It takes you like seconds. Oh, yeah. At the time I was <laughs> like I was I was 100. percent My wife still hates this. Every time we're traveling, I'll start packing like a few minutes before we're leaving, uh -huh. and she just does not get it. And so just because it's not pressure for me at this point, I, yeah. I the reason why I'm always in black t-shirts is because it can't go wrong. Just keep them folded, and when you need to leave, and you're out. You you go in. Yeah. yeah. Another thing that intrigued me was when you say that you've lived so many lifetimes mm. that you've forgotten some of them. What do yeah. you mean by this? So, um, wow, this is a tricky one. So, uh, also, I think my entire life was situations changing quite a lot. Um, so, in, in the beginning, it was, you know, regular Kenyan kid in Nairobi, went to Hospital Hill, Shout out to some people who are also there. <laughs> um, and uh, everything was normal. 1994, 95, um, left the country for the first time. Um, 
and then we went to the States and then to Canada and then came back. Um, again, we were not rich. My mom was a teacher. She just happened to be teaching in those places. Also single mom with yeah. two kids. There's really no amount of money that can make that an easy situation. But um, especially in, in the early 90s as a woman. Mm -hmm. But um, when you get to the States, the first thing you realize is you're not from there. And this is not now when people have been exposed to the world this is back then so you you experience being black in america being african in america being all these things and you live that life in like a snapshot of time and then you shift to um canada mm -hmm. and halifax and it's like another different experience and then you come back to kenya and they're telling you you're not kenyan enough because you left the country and then we left and went to senegal and it was the same experience mm -hmm. where it's a whole different language it's a yeah. whole different religion it's a whole different this a whole different that and then you come back to kenya and again you're not kenyan enough again because you've just come back from this other place but at the time we came back we went from um very like lower middle class to upper middle class because of the type of work my mom was doing at the time so you're also experiencing a new class of things that you're not used to. Yeah. And you're still being treated like the poor kid in a rich school. And it's like all these different things. And then add the other side of... Um, I was kind of academically lucky, I guess. I, I, I don't say I was... I passed school, so I finished very young. And um, for a lot of people, that was, like, said the smart academic kid. But for mm -hmm. me, it was just I was trying to get out of school. I hated school. Um, so by the time I'm getting to uni, I'm being looked at as the scholarship kid. But then I'm also the business kid, and I'm also the creative, and I'm the engineering student, and I'm this and that. And you end up in all these different circles. And then my side hustle is this music website, which gets me into this music job. So I'm doing music yeah. while I'm a student, while I'm doing this, while I'm doing... And somewhere in the middle, there's some things I did I don't remember. Mm -hmm. So, like, the other day we found an award in the house, and I was like, oh, yeah, I remember that. And I, had I hadn't thought about it since, like, 2008. Yeah. I'm like, I remember. I did this thing. It was a magazine and blah, 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 and it won an award. Like, I should keep that. I don't know where it is. So there's, there's instances of... Um, <clears throat> there are moments that... I was on such a gear five, take every opportunity when it comes up. Um, that, I mean, it has a functional benefit in that I was able to build and accrue a certain amount of like wealth and value at a very mm -hmm. young age. Um, but an experience more than anything. Um, but I'll, I'll say two things. One, uh, fast money comes fast. It leaves a lot quicker. <clears throat> and two, um, doing more just sometimes means you have to live less. Mm. Um, so you, you end up losing out on the opportunity to be present in what you're doing. If you had 100 interviews today, you would only be able to ask one question for each one. You'd yeah. only be able to get to know a little bit of each person. But if you take time to spread it out and just have one a day, mm -hmm. you're able to have more meaningful conversations. It's the same thing with pretty much every interaction in life. So... Um, a lot of the things I did, really cool. Like, highlight reel would look really cool if I was on social media back then. Yeah. Game changer. I would be really popular. But then at the same time, I would look at those pictures the same way other people are looking at them mm -hmm. and be like, wow, that happened. I'd, I'd be a spectator in my own life. And that's, yeah. that, was a, that was a realization. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a big... As I was writing this, I was actually genuinely thinking, at 23, yeah... And then there was a lot of negative. I'm not talking about the negative so much, but there was a lot of negative. There was a lot of death. There was a lot of um, hate. There was a lot of things that happened where you end sickness and so on and so forth. There's a lot of things that happened that you, you forget. And then later on in like your quiet moments, like in the middle of the night when I'm rocking my daughter to sleep, I'll just be like, that, Damn. <laughs> yeah, that, that happened. That yeah. really, really happened. Like, I never saw that guy again because, you know, X, Y, Z happened to him. Yeah, yeah so that's, that's, um, that's what I meant. Someone needs to make a movie. <laughs> the Growing Father, the movie. <laughs> and you have, like, part one to part ten because, yeah, you really lived. Um, um, mm -hmm. I don't know if it would make a good movie. I feel like it would, it would be disjointed. One of the things I, I've realized a little bit with time is reality is a lot more um, dense than mm -hmm. fiction. 
because in fiction you have like a linear you there's a storyline you yeah. can follow the storyline with um reality 10 million things can happen today mm-hmm. and you have no control of of how they happen yeah yeah so who are some of the mentors and like great minds that you come across throughout uh, what are some like important things that they had to tell you mm. yeah okay um i'm i'm going to avoid naming names mm-hmm. uh but i've been i've i've been lucky enough to work with people who like they've been they've been such part of such big projects actually i'll name 3 mm-hmm. um there's one guy who i worked with who um he was uh he was like a general i think like a four star general in retired <clears throat> in the army a guy called carmen caveza and his experience was so vast in so many different ways because one obviously getting to that high of a rank you you've been around for a lot of things but mm-hmm. then two he ran a leadership institute so he'd met everybody you can imagine like at some point or another he'd met them um and exchanged ideas with them and then three he was like the most attentive person he would listen and remember everything you told him so he was like a wealth of knowledge the advice he gave you was often so condensed and so measured that you could sit down with him and tell him this is what i'm going through and he'll listen to your whole problem and you know actively listen prompt you with some questions and what not and then say one thing that kind of just freezes you in your place and he gets up and walks away because he knows you need time to process it. Yeah. So one of the things he told me um very early on was um there's no point in potential if you're just going to sit on it. And this was I mean see in isolation that means nothing to anyone but this was at a time when I was having a lot of crises and kind of getting stressed out by all of them. and telling me I want to do this and I want to do this and I want to do that and he basically just said that and walked away and for me that was like not helping my life I'm trying yeah. to figure out what to do with my schedule <laughs> um it's later on that I realized what he's telling me is like pick pick make a choice you know because you you can do anything right now it's possible for anyone to do or be anything they want to be as long as they have the potential to do it but if you do nothing with it if you sit on the potential if you can you look at if someone looks at you and says oh i can do that i can create content like that i can do an interview i can host a podcast i know i am i can get this shot right and they don't mm-hmm. then the potential means nothing but if they say i can do this and then follow it up with action then it means something yeah now if you sit on a lot of it all that ends up happening is that you just put yourself in a position of a lot of possibilities and nothing getting done and that's where the stress comes from. Mm. So it's not a scheduling problem, it's a decision making problem. Things like that except multiply by like multiple different people. Um it's another guy who um I had the pleasure of working with and and I mean we're still friends, we still talk. Um he's he's big on privacy so I'll just call him John. Uh I mean John is actually one of his names so I'll just call him John, but he we worked with him during the blogging days so back when blogs were blogs mm-hmm. before you content creators came up <laughs> with your multimedia um there was a time when um you know people just wrote and he he was a teacher but he was also you know um blogging right and this was where we made a good amount of money we did a bunch of festivals and things like that <clears throat> and he said something to me like he once he sent me out to do an interview and that's actually how I ended up getting the job that I got but he sent me out to do an interview and the interview came back crazy long like it was 6 hours of a conversation with um some producer who we knew but nobody really cared about and we had to break it up into maybe 10 different interviews and he said you need to learn to listen if you want to be able to like synthesize conversations into what matters the most out of them because otherwise you're just going to talk and even you won't remember what you said and then you know again i just didn't listen it's like that's one of the worst things about being told learn to listen mm-hmm. but you know as we've we've grown over time i've realized it's it's that skill that he had and he'd perfected it like he'd really taken time to like learn how to actively you know look you in the eye and hear what you're saying and interpret it and ask questions when he doesn't understand so that by the time he says something he's saying something of value 
Um, yeah, and then the 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 last person who <laughs> who I kind of want to mention, his name is Mark. Um, he was my boss for a few. I don't even know if he remembers me like that, but anyway, um, he he basically just told me, if you don't know how to do it, don't do it. Um, you take a step back. So if you're not at this stage right now, take a step back. If you don't understand something, take the step back. And there's nothing wrong with taking a step back. Mm-hmm. Um, he, he very frequently would say taking a step back is how you make the biggest steps forward. So um, it's something I apply now. Where if I'm talking about something, I'm not sure about it. Go home, take an extra day, learn about it. Mm-hmm. And if I come out feeling like I can't talk about it, I will. And if I come out feeling like I'm still not equipped then the step back means I can take a step in another direction. So, yeah, um, yeah. again, all that 10, 15 years ago did not pay attention. Yeah. So as a result of not paying attention, what are some lessons that you had to learn the hard way? Uh, All of them. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, well, I I say all of them, but like a lot of them. Um, Things, I mean, things my mom taught me as I was a kid, don't compare yourself to other people, even though some people stole my birthday. Um, but no, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, like she, one of the big things she always said is just don't compare yourself with other people. Um, and you, you always think about that in the sense of like being competitive, but it also has a lot to do with the envy cycle and looking at people and saying, I want to be that, and then doing that, or <clears throat> seeing that this is how someone else did it and trying to do it the same way, mm-hmm. or, you know, literally just copy pasting what someone like find your own way find your own truth that was a hard lesson because i tried a lot of things that i saw working for a lot of people mm-hmm. and then um realized that you can achieve success and feel nothing for it uh because it wasn't your success it wasn't what mattered to you um so you know, you know like the way i said live the life you love was my motto then yeah. um right now it's do less and live more and it's the idea of just reduce and increase where it matters so um some of that comes to comparative some of that comes to just holding yourself back practice restraint some of that comes from empathizing more mm-hmm. and being more intentional about what you do and being more deliberate about how you process things. Yeah, and some of it just comes from allow yourself to do things that just feel good, you know. I hate hated for a long time um, interviews and being on camera. Like most of my online life, most of my business life prior to 2016 is you would struggle to find a picture. Genuinely, you'd struggle to find a paper trail. Um, And it was very intentional. But a lot of it had to do with the fact that, you know, I I didn't want to get caught smiling about how happy I was doing something. You Mm. don't want to go on a roller coaster and laugh, that funny laugh that people might hear you and go. (laughs) You know, you don't want to get caught looking silly. And sometimes that's that's really where the juice of life is. Sometimes those moments of embarrassment and vulnerability and reality is what you just need to allow yourself and you feel guilt like you feel the guilt of all the bad things that have happened do I deserve to do this you know like Mm -hmm. all the people I left behind do I deserve to be the one here sometimes you just kind of have to say maybe I do yeah yeah and the second lesson was do not lie yeah especially do not lie to yourself oh yeah so what sort of lies were was said telling to himself at 23, <laughs> and how were these lies also a form of self-protection? Mm. The biggest one is that you're okay. Yeah. You know, like, the times you feel genuinely, you know you're not fine. Um, I had a therapist who said this, uh, like, I, very, very early on. I had a therapist who I walked into her office and just said, I don't know why I'm here, I just don't feel okay. Mm-hmm. And she said not feeling okay is the first sign you should be here. And, you know, that that kind of hit me in a weird way because there are many times prior that I thought that and then I'd look around and be like, you have food, you have water, you have money, you have this, you're fine. Yeah. And you, you justify that, you know what I mean? If you wake up in the morning and you're feeling exhausted and you're like, but I slept, I'm fine. Mm-hmm. That easily the biggest lie I told myself is just keep going. 
And sometimes, no, don't, don't keep going. Sometimes take a pause, take a step to the side, take a step back. <clears throat> yeah, probably the biggest one. The second one was um, you know, that, that it was okay to, to mislead people. Um, like I mentioned, being an outsider in a lot of settings that I was in, it was, um, it was easier to either be disingenuous or to just straight up um, manipulate people into having a perception of you mm -hmm. um, so that you don't have to deal with them. And um, I would justify that and tell myself it was okay to do that. Because if you walk into a room, nobody knows who you are, right? Yeah. So you can walk in and be whoever you want to be. So next time you walk into a room, try that. Walk in and give an order. <clears throat> People will immediately assume you're somebody that you're not. It really doesn't matter, yeah? I've, I've realized over time, just it really doesn't matter because I don't look like much, I don't think. I don't look like, I don't look like the role that I have in life. Mm -hmm. um, but if I walked in and projected it, 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 people would presume it. If I walk in and project nothing, I have been mistaken for production in my own production company, which is fine. I'm cool yeah. with that. But back then, I would play roles. I would intentionally know that if I'm going to you know, this type of meeting, meeting this type of person, and I want them to think this, I'll play up to that. I will intentionally malign you just so that I can get what I want to get out of this. And it, it led to, it makes it a habit because then you end up doing it for really petty reasons as well. Mm. Sometimes it's not profitable. You're just lying for the sake of lying. Mm. Um, so that, that was also problematic. Um, yeah, and then of course, sometimes it was just, the thing mm. is when you lie so much, you can tell the truth and someone thinks that you're, you're BSing. Mm -hmm. So like, I remember there was one person who I, I uh, my ex, who was really mad because she knew that there were a lot of things I was saying that weren't true. And then one time I showed her a picture of my friend's baby. And I was like, oh, yeah, you know, Jay just had a kid. And she's like, Psh, please. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, You're no, like, but I'm, I'm being serious. Yeah. This is, and she just did not believe it. I'm like, no, this is my friend, and he does this. And she's like, Psh. Sure. <laughs> yeah, like I, I would literally have to show her these things, and she still goes, nah. Mm -hmm. And I realized it's not her fault. I can't blame her for not believing me. I never gave her a reason to. So um, a lot of those realizations at the time, if you lie to yourself, mm -hmm. you'll keep lying. It's easier to just break out of it. You're wasting so much time not being real. Okay, so how would you say that some of these lies affected you and um, the people around you? I know you've mentioned um, like how with your ex now, mm -hmm. she wouldn't believe you anymore. Mm -hmm. So are there any other ways um, it affected you and the people around you? <laughs> Um, what, like back then or right yes, now? Yes, back then. Back then, it did affect a few people. Because like I mentioned, I had a perception problem. Mm -hmm. um, everyone knew I was never doing what I was supposed to be doing most of the time. So when like the deportation thing happened, the assumption was that I got deported, which I didn't mm -hmm. technically. But um, the assumption was that I had done something. And that was just because of, but you never go to class but this one time I did. You know, yeah. it's a crying wolf thing. So I think I had a genuine um, issue back then. The second thing I would say is um, I had a reputation with... Um, I had a reputation with people who I worked with of perpetually being the hardest worker in the room. So there was always an expectation that if someone is going to be in the office till three in the morning and back in the office by six a.m., it's me. This, and and this carried on for several years. Um, I was I was in agency and that was how it was there as well. Um, and the problem with that is that that became my perception of myself. Like I became that guy, which I don't think I was. Mm -hmm. But you do it because the expectation is there. Yeah. Um, yeah. But outside of that. It really it became a uh, <clears throat> it became a thing where you're trying to live to other people's expectations rather than by your own standards, and that that was that was a problem for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you say um, basically get help um, and open up. You need to talk to someone. You don't mm. need to trust everyone, but mm. you need to trust someone. Mm. And I know you mentioned therapy, so I'm assuming mm -hmm. that you did get 
um, help through therapy, which is actually a prevailing theme on a letter to my younger self. Everyone is always saying, yeah, get go therapy. to therapy. Yeah. Um, so, but then when it comes to the part for talk to someone, mm-hmm. you know, open up to someone, did you end up opening up to anyone? Eventually, yes. Mm-hmm. In July of 2010, um, I, I married her. Mm. Um, yeah, oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I did. Uh, but the therapy thing happened way later. Like mm. it, it took a while. I had been to therapy before because of insomnia. Uh, so I'd done uh, sleep therapy and uh, different. Like I tried everything because I, I didn't sleep much. And this this is honestly one of the first signs. Okay, let me pause for a second and do the thing that. Um, Irene warned you that I would do. Let me pause for a second and explain this concept. Mental health practice and the general insight on how mental health is treated has changed so significantly in the last two decades that it's very easy to forget that people who are over 35, uh, when they were 20, would not have been encouraged to get therapy. All right? Yeah. Um, The tools weren't there to be able to adequately advise them on ways forward. There were a lot of things that were very perpetually misdiagnosed. The tendency to over-medicate was very real, and the expense was significant. So it was not accessible, it was not practical, and a lot of times it was not well done. It was also not standardized in many places or regulated properly, so lots of things there. I say that because um, when I was, when I really needed it, like when traumatic events were happening in different parts of my life, like one of my best friends died, went like literally in front of me, and um, you you sit with that, and when you talk to other people, they'll tell you get help, mm-hmm. and when you go to get help, they're like, oh, you you just need to sleep. So that's not help. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so uh, even though I wasn't sleeping, which is, you know, the problem they're trying to fix, the, the underlying issue is just, you know, there's, there's a lot of things. There was a very unresolved relationship. Mm-hmm. We were literally on the way to do something and this happened. So it, there's a lot of things that were, were pending. And um, because of all that pent-up energy, plus all the other things happening in my life and um, association where, you, where if it can happen to you, it can happen to me. So yeah. I have like this fear of that could have easily been me, not you. And so many of those things. Um, but I didn't have that conversation until, so that happened in like 2006, I think, or five. I didn't have that conversation with a therapist until um, 10 years later. Mm-hmm. So for 10 years, you're kind of sitting with all of this because, oh, yeah. yeah, you sit with that trauma and you compound it with all the other traumas that you have and all the other issues that you have. So, yeah, I mean, I think at the time it would have helped to talk to someone because the one thing that therapy and therapists do really well now is they listen more than they um, diagnose and more than they prescribe. Mm-hmm. And they will ask you to kind of, they'll guide you to kind of find what you need to get out of yourself and yeah now that's that's extremely helpful so anybody who can i mean do it if yeah. if there's a lot of occasionally there are free services out there the people who do it at very subsidized costs the virtual options um if you're going to invest in something invest in yourself yeah lesson number 3 was love more mm. um what does feeling love and giving love mean to you now Mm. and what have you learned that it means to other people as well um (laughs) i don't know if i'm the best person to talk about this but anyway let me try love is one of those things that it is very much a give and take there's there's um you can love something um that doesn't have to love you back, but it's very difficult to um, love someone who doesn't love you back, right? Um, I feel like in many cases that's kind of misplaced affection. I feel like love in its best form, in its most perfect form, is something that you cultivate, where you and the person that you're with kind of, regardless of whether it's a friendship or if it's um, you know romantic or whether it's family or whatever, but you build on something, you give and take, it's an exchange that happens. 
And um, it's very difficult to get to having that type of deep uh, connection without taking time to appreciate all the different facets of it. So, for example, it's very difficult to fully appreciate how much your parents love you if you don't take time to think about all the things that they've done for you. You know, it's very easy to be like, oh, yeah, you know, my mom paid for me to go to school. It's a very different story to think she was somewhere late at night working extra hours, knowing she's leaving her children at home mm -hmm. so that 10 years down the line, she'd be able to send me to any school I wanted to. That's how much she thought about me. That's how much she loved me. And she didn't just do that, you know, at the time, she'd been planning that. She'd been building towards that. Like, really deeply empathizing with what this person is doing mm -hmm. because then that changes how you express yourself to that person. So when I say love more and not in quantity but in quality, is to take the time to actually look around you and see where this is coming from, where this positive energy is coming from, um, and reciprocate it every chance you get. Sometimes, I mean, and this is the thing, I think people also need to get out of demystifying love as an end-all, be-all, like magnanimous, massive thing. It doesn't mm -hmm. have to be the biggest form of love. Sometimes love is just a, in a very small state, like, I love what you're doing, and I love, like, this you know, interaction that we've been having over the last few years. If you show love, I will give love because it's important to do that because what can what bad can come of that? You know what I mean? Yeah. But instead what tends to happen, especially for men, is that that vulnerability, you don't want to give that away. You don't want to lose the machismo. You don't want to, you know, be, I don't know, whatever perceptions of like, wussy and feminine and things that are associated with having an emotion without realizing that the realest, strongest, most courageous thing you can do is to get in touch with your emotions and figure out how you express yourself in that way. So, you know, it might not be that you have to tell someone that you love them every day, but mm -hmm. it, it's important to kind of think about the people that matter to you and think about whether or not you're doing what matters to them. Um, think about the things that matter to you and think about whether or not you're doing them to them. But the most important, by far the most important, if you take nothing else from this, I may, I'm really building this one up. <clears throat> There's a quote I saw the other day, and it's, it's rising up to be one of my favorite quotes, and said the love of your life should be the love of your life. And what that means is not that the person you choose to love for the rest of your life should be the person you choose to love for the rest of your life. What it means is the love of your life should be the love of your life. Mm. So making sure that you actually love your life and not just your life in terms of wabosha loving wabosha, but your life in terms of the things that matter to you. Every single human being, every single facet of this, your family, your friends, that's your life. Yeah. yeah it's not just you. And loving that should be what you build yourself around. That it should be what you have a strong relationship with. It should be what you love yeah. for your life mm -hmm. so yeah um i think that that for me is it's a nice way to summarize where i'm trying to go i don't think i've gotten there yet but it's it's my priority i shifted from having a number which was my previous goal like i had a very fixed i'm trying to make x amount by this age to i'm trying to retire with a life full of love yeah yeah, yeah. And I also really like how um, you described the value of life, mm. basically that we all have, you know, a finite number of heartbeats. And mm -hmm. when you think about it, you know, you don't really know how many more heartbeats you have left with someone. Yeah. And when you think of it that way, you know, it's really hard to, you know, mm -hmm. just not appreciate life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, that was one of the, it's something I had been told many times, like spend your heartbeats like currency. The same one of the guys I talked about earlier had, had told me this and um, you just never really think about it until until you get to that point where life shows you yeah. you know life takes away someone that you didn't have time to tell you know you matter you mean so much to me you are so significant in my life um, and those losses 
that like you don't have to get your lessons from losses make sure i say that right yeah you, but you don't need to get your lessons from losses sometimes it can just be that you are present enough when it was happening to be able to say you know what i i said everything i could to that person i did everything i could for that person yeah. and i did it every chance i got um and you know you don't know i think for for any situation you don't know when um your life and your ability to show this love will expire but you do know that that ability decreases every time you breathe so make the most of each breath make the most of each word try to be as positive and as personal and as purposeful with everything that you do because sometimes just an act of love is very simply saying i support this it's very simply showing up when someone says oh show up for this yeah it's very simply saying <clears throat> i don't want to be on camera but you know what hopefully one person sees this and goes that was useful yeah yeah and i'm trying or rather i was trying to comprehend your letter like in its you know wholeness mm. and correct me if i'm wrong mm-hmm. but this is what i got from it is that said or rather even 23 year old said mm. was a very um emotional person um with mm. a lot of um baggage basically yeah, yeah. um and then you felt like you really couldn't trust anyone mm-hmm with anything and so in order to protect yourself you sort of distanced yourself from other people yeah um and this was as a result of basically a lot of you know negative things that had mm-hmm. happened in your life mm-hmm. this right mm-hmm. um so what are some negative things that happened that made you feel like you needed to distance yourself from mm-hmm. other people um i think i can kind of cluster them into three um the the lowest but the most frequent was uh like neglect um you don't realize this but it's one of the things that um you know there's a bunch of studies around this but it's one of the things that carries the most from your childhood mm-hmm. is uh, a feeling of neglect and building a sense of being deserving of neglect means that you never really process the pain of it. And what that means is if you're in a situation and um you stub your toe mm-hmm. and it's a genuine real pain but then she, you know, severs her foot and everybody goes there and that's your first interaction with sometimes I can hurt and nobody will notice. And then you repeat that over time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in different ways. And, yeah. and sometimes emotional, sometimes whatever. Um what ends up happening is when you isolate yourself then the neglect you feel which is self-imposed because sometimes I would be going through something and no one would know because my circle was so small and nobody in my circle connected with each other mm-hmm. so like the best friend I talked about he was a loner as well so it was literally me and him yeah. so when when he passed away at the funeral there were five people which meant i had no one to talk to about it for like 5 years you know so this this neglect which i think is is the first one um injustice is the second and this kind of carries in i hope crack knuckles don't pop up on mic but if they do <laughs> enjoy um <clears throat> but uh injustice is the second one and it's always been a very big one for me because um being in the states being muslim black immigrant in new york post 9/11 i have experienced the brunt of you know everything that you've heard in terms of injustice from police mm-hmm. um i have a story for each one of those things um and i mean like the entire spectrum of it but again put authority aside from human beings like being treated as subhuman because you're poor or because you're different or because you don't speak the language or because you're a different tribe or so many of those instances of just blatant injustice mm-hmm. um were a really really big part of what formulated my feeling and my thinking about things because you you end up having to get a perspective that's a little bit bigger than you um and it takes quite a bit of time to get there because 
you have to process your personal pain to realize where this fits in the larger scheme of things. So part of that is why I feel so strongly about causes like um, just human rights in general, women's rights. As I, we've talked about this because yeah. of, you know, um, working on certain campaigns. But like the, the reason why I'm so passionate about those things is because I genuinely, genuinely empathize with what it's like to have a system working against you and it means a lot to me to be in a position where I can do or say anything about that. You know, um, I will go to every protest I can when it comes to everything from speaking up for Palestine to speaking up. For, like, I will do it every chance I get just because I don't want 10 years down the line to look my child in the face and say, I could have done something and I didn't. Yeah. Yeah, so... Um, that was that was one of the big things that happened back then. I had I went through a lot of those instances um, of dealing with, you know, whether it's the police or not getting a job or getting kicked out of the country or coming back here and dealing with racism at work because a lot of institutions are like that, to dealing with racism in business because a lot of people will do business with, I mean, and even in Kenya, um, I can tell you as a business owner, the there are businesses we don't get because we're not the right skin color when we walk in the room. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure, you know, even on the production side, you know this, yeah? There's jobs you can't go. I can't go pitch to Nat Geo if I don't go with a white director. And, I mean, I'm sure they, they'll say, no, we are... Ex uh, but I'm pretty <laughs> sure if you show all the directors who shot anything in yeah. Kenya in the last year, 19 out of 20 are not black or brown. Mm -hmm. So... Um, that level, like that pain, is something which was there then and it's there now. It's just that now I'm in a position where I can do something about it in many cases. Some cases I can't, but in those cases I still speak up. And yeah. the power of speaking up is something that came out of that. <sighs> yeah, and then um, the last one was just loss. Um, I think I was unfortunate enough to um, to have experienced a certain amount of losing people that were very close to me in a very short amount of time and in some of the most unfair situations um, that I can think of. Some of them were... I don't think... Um, I don't think all loss impacted me the same way. So, like, my grandfather dying, he was sick for a long time, so we were close. We, we had a lot of... Like, the suit I wore to my graduation was his suit. Mm. Um, but at the same time, I knew it was coming for a long time. So we spent significant moments talking about a lot of things, which is very different from a friend of mine who um, she turned 18 and was super happy because like she, we, she'd gone through quite a lot. And then, um, you know, she got this really good job. She bought herself her first car. She was moving out of the house. And mm -hmm. then two days after buying that first car, she was on an accident in the highway and died. Mm -hmm. And it's like... You, you start really carrying a lot of that pain. And this was, you know, a year, no, two years after my other friend. Mm -hmm. And just all these little instances, I think they added up to um, things I just never thought to process. I never bothered talking about. I would have taken them to the, like that said, mm -hmm. would never have talked about it. But then you realize it colors your life because part of the reason why I kept people at arms like this, I never wanted to feel that again. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to get close enough to someone that if they went, I'd feel something. And um, what life will teach you is that you have no control over that. You genuinely have no control over that. Yeah. You can isolate yourself and you will still feel pain. Mm -hmm. um, so the best thing to do is to give yourself enough love to be able to support that to learn how to process it so that you can be able to come out stronger and to put yourself in the positions to make changes to the things that matter. At, um, not really powerful, but um, at 20... <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. At 23, your life motto was love the life you live and live the life you love. Yeah. But then you said it changed to... Um, do less and live more. Yes, do less and live more. Yeah. And then you also mentioned that um, you also mentioned something about your favorite quote. Yeah, one of my favorite quotes. Yes. So yeah. now, what is your favorite quote? That is a very so. My favorite quote, I think, is everything in moderation, including moderation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it's it's favorite because I use it the most. Um, it's it's that idea of just. 
be very measured, but don't measure people too much and don't measure things too much. You know, that, that's, that's, it's, it's a guiding principle. It's almost a mantra. I say it so frequently that I sometimes feel like maybe I need to stop saying it. Mm -hmm. Um, but like I said, the, the, the love of your life should be the love of your life is, is creeping up very strongly because, uh, my cousin, um, Hiromi, shout out, uh, introduced that to me. And she's one of, she's probably one of the most lovely souls in the world. But um, she she sent it to me. And I the time she sent it to me was so important. Like it was so critical because I'd kind of hit, I kind of hit a point where I was trying to figure out what I'm doing. And you know, you can lose steam and and try to just remember what you're trying to do. And then, you know, it, it was a nice reset. Yeah. And I think that impact is something I won't forget. So it's creeping up on the list. It's creeping up on the list. Yeah. What do you think 23-year-old said would think of 37-year-old said? Wow, you're old. And Because <laughs> uh, <laughs> I genuinely didn't think I was going to make it. Like I mentioned the association thing. Mm -hmm. You know, when you watch so many people not make it past 25, you're just like, Statistically, anytime now. <laughs> yeah, it's like yeah, I'm just gonna like ball out because there's a possibility I won't make it, and then um, so yeah, first it would be wow, you're old, and then it would be second, you're a dad and you're married. Both of those things would be we would have to have a conversation about them. Yeah. Um, yeah, but do I think I don't know. Sometimes I struggle with, would I be proud of where I am? And I think it would take some conversation to make sure that mm -hmm. I was. Um, it, I struggle with the, how I would have perceived it now. I genuinely feel like I was a completely different person. Um, I genuinely feel like I can look back and I, I know how I feel looking back where I would want to say so much to this little human being and just be like, you'll be fine. Yeah. Um, you know, just, just there's so much of that person that I see in the youth today, which is, you know, a whole other conversation. But, like, there's so much of that that I see in people today where, you know, for the Gen Zs who feel like you're unique in what you're going through right now, we've been there and we mm -hmm. were the same exact way. Um, it changes. Um, it changes, but yeah, I don't know. I don't know. You know that that dude was very hard headed and did not listen. So yeah. even if he saw me right now, he'd just be like, ah, oh, <laughs> preachy mother, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. I don't know um, how that would go. Um, I guess he'd appreciate that I still dress the same. Yeah. And I'm happy you even say that because it's one of the purposes of this podcast to mm. basically show other people to trust the process mm -hmm. and that. It, it ends up the way it's supposed to end up. Yep. Everything, you know, turns out all right. Yeah. Yeah, and it's about that time, the podcast, where we do um, a time capsule sort of thing. Okay. And you get to leave a message to 47-year-old said. Oof. Yeah, so you can take some time, think about what you'd like to say, and then when you're ready, that the camera. All goes well. You should be three years from retiring. And if you are... Congrats on keeping that going. Um, I hope you've achieved everything you want to achieve, but I also hope that you feel um, fulfilled in everything that you've done. Um, say hi to the kids. Yeah, and uh, tell everyone that I love that I love them. And yeah, I, I think I think... We should be okay. I hope we're, we'll be okay. Yeah. I'll do my best to make sure that we're okay. Take care. Don't drink. <laughs> <laughs> right, so hopefully I'll be looking for you in 10 years. Please do. To, to give you back this message. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for coming. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah. Yeah, it was a really beautiful episode. And throughout, I just kept on thinking... <laughs> oh, I need to send this to this person, I need to send this to this person, like oh, cool. this person would find this part really, really, you know, interesting. So yeah, it was a wonderful episode. I personally really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. I, I genuinely appreciate and I honestly appreciate the work that you're doing with this. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of person, like a lot of 
value has come from from the the things that you do with this. I can tell you for a fact, I know people in the office who deeply resonate with specific um, episodes and specific things that, I mean, I mentioned coming in that there's things that were said even in the last few episodes that they have an impact and it has a lot of value. Mm -hmm. And um, it means a lot for someone like you to decide to take time to do something this meaningful when it's easier to do something that's not meaningful. So I genuinely applaud the the courage and the intention that it takes to do that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, gosh. Hmm? <laughs> <laughs> Just a little bit. If we can get it on camera. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But that's all from us. Mm -hmm. um, and you guys at home, thank you so much for watching. And we'll catch you guys on the next episode. Bye. Bye-bye.